Cricket Last Stories with me, Neil Kagram, and today we're joined by Min Patel. Min, appreciate your time. No, thanks, Neil. Thanks for having um, me. So, born in Mumbai, was cricket always a passion of yours? Yeah, um, 1970, I was born in Mumbai, uh, and early memories with Dad playing um, at the Hindu Jim Gymkhana on Marine Drive there, where there's four or five grounds all, all facing the sea. But, um, yeah, going to watch Dad, so... Um, that's my earliest memories of watching my dad play cricket and being being enthralled by the game, I guess. And the age you came over to, to the UK? I uh, came over in 75. Um, me, two younger brothers, mum and dad, more really, I think my parents really wanted us to have a more of a Western education. Um, so we came over and um, my, my cricket upbringing, if you like, education in cricket was over here, but the passion probably started back in India. And you scored in Dartford? Yeah, Dartford Grammar School. Um, so those were years were 80, 88, and um, uh, that's where I really went from starting school thinking I could bowl left arm super quick and realising at 13 I was just a slow bowler. So it turned into spin and uh, those sort of teenage years and through school, um, even then Dartford Grammar School had a really robust fixture programme, which a lot of grammar schools and state schools don't now. So I was very fortunate to be there at a time when when um, cricket was thriving and I, I could really sort of hone and develop my skills. And did you come through the Kent Academy or how was your talent spotted? No, not really. Um, I had a very brief stint in the Kent Age Group programme. Um, only played a couple of games at under 15 level, but at 16 I joined Blackheath um, where my cricket master at Darfur Grammar School was playing and um, I sort of dominated last six games of a season in the Premier League at the age of 16 um, got noticed by Colin Page at the time he was, he was Kent coach and had the opportunity to start training with Kent then went to play second 11 the following year and very quickly got a first class debut before I'd got a contract so um, mine wasn't the normal curve for, for a, a county cricketer that comes through a pathway and a system mine was very much dominated through club cricket and you said your debut in 1989 against Middlesex yeah how did that make you feel? As you said, you've come through more unconventional routes. Yeah, um, it, everything was happening quite quickly then. I was still playing, you know, I was still playing school cricket in the summer. So, you, you know, probably even a month out or say two months out, you don't envisage you're going to be walking out to play at Canterbury against Mike Gatting and Mark Rampricash, Angus Fraser and Norman Cowan's Tufnell, Embury. Um, it's one of those where it's a bit of a blur, but the journey was quite a quick one. I. I played a couple of second team games and took um, I took 11 in the day against Gloucester at Dover in a second team game and I think that was the catalyst to, to Chris Cowdery and the coaching staff saying actually we'd like to see Min in the first team. So I played the last game of the year against Middlesex. And did you have anything outside of cricket that you were also focusing on? or Not know? focusing, no, but I did play a lot of sports very badly but that, that was always with a means to an end to try and play cricket. Um, um, I played rugby, I played football, I played I cross country, which I hated. Um, I love badminton, but so I played badminton. But a lot of other sporting interests, without without them ever being a real focus, apart from actually all serving me to get fitter or better at doing what I need to do, play cricket. So, uh, and beside that, um, not overly academic, but um, but that's because the summers were filled with cricket and, and less revision. And would you say that period, starting from nineteen ninety four, was really where you? career kind of took off. I know in the championship you took close to 90 wickets at 22, the yeah. most by any bowler in the country. Yeah, I, I, again I was fortunate probably to have a little bit of first class experience behind me through my university years so uh, even though I didn't play full time till the 94 season um, I'd had, I'd probably had 20 odd games of first class cricket maybe under my belt by the time that first full season came around, maybe more, I can't remember but again within that I'd had a couple of um, successful outings in taking five wickets in innings and stuff. So I wasn't entering county cricket in 1994 completely green. I was I had a little bit of um, experience of a few games. So 94 was a, obviously the breakthrough year for me. But um, but there was some education that was really vital to to how 94 went in the previous four years. And then international rec recognition followed. You were picked for the A tour. A year later, in '95, to tour India. Yeah, it was, well, it was the '94 five. So we, uh, at the back end of the '94 season, I was selected on the, um, at the time, like quite a daunting task, really, a uh, two and a half month tour India and Bangladesh, um, playing three Test matches in India. How but old we, were you then? Uh, I was 24. 24. Yeah, 
Uh, it was a great tour to go out there in those conditions, but they had a really good side with Rahul's, Rahul's doing the equivalent of me and making his way, Surav as well. So to go there and beat them 3-0, um, having lost all three tosses in the test matches, there was an outstanding achievement, but we had a really good side. Probably not enough of those players in that touring party of ours ended up playing enough international cricket. But yeah, so who was involved in that tour? Uh, Mark Ramprakash was on that tour, Nick Knight was on that tour, Jason Gallion, Dominic Cork, Glenn Chappell, myself, Ian Salisbury, Keith Piper, Paul Nixon. Um, Household names, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a lot of really, really strong county cricketers with long, long careers. Yeah. But a lot of us guys ended up only probably playing a handful of internationals. A couple of them went and played more. Nick had a very good white ball career. Um, but, you know, uh, David Hemp was on there as well. So we had a number of guys who didn't quite probably have that longevity around international cricket that maybe that tour indicated we might. And how did you do personally on that tour? Um, I had a successful tour, actually. Um, a lot of pressure must have been on yourself with in India turning wickets. Yeah, as we did, the yeah, there wasn't actually in the sense that why we won that tour wasn't really the spinners. We played our part and we all bowled okay. Salisbury, myself and a guy called Richard Stemp. Um, we bowled well, but the real game changers and difference were uh, a Corky and Chapel, Dom and Glenn Chapel, who, who both had a great ability to take wickets with a new and old ball with reverse swing. And... Um, they were the game changers because our, our, our seamers were constantly taking wickets for us, whereas the Indian seamers struggled p probably to take wickets. So um, from my point of view, it was a successful tour without being a dominant tour, but, you know, chipped away, bowled well in the games so I had to bowl well, and even um, a couple of times batted quite nicely in, in some crucial partnerships. So I look back on that and go, yeah, I did okay, it was a good tour. And then a year later, the next summer, 1996, you mm. get picked for England yeah. um, against India, yeah. the country of your birth. For, uh, for that, how, how did that make you feel? You know, against India, family? Yeah, I didn't really think about it. I wasn't thinking about the fact it was against India necessarily. It was more the fact that I was actually representing, representing England. England. And um, again, I'd started 96 really well. I'd... Uh, we played Lancashire first game of the year and it was a, it was a rain curtailed game and it became a one innings affair and I took five for there against Athers who was captain. Then we went to Ilford to play Essex and they had Nasser and Gucci. Gucci was a selector and Nasser was obviously um, senior a player. senior player now for England. And um, again in that one we won and took 10 wickets there. So um, those performances at the start of the season also came in front of the right people. So... Um, um, you know, I got 90 wickets in 94. I took a, a decent amount in 95. But I'd argue that my consistency of performances over 94, 95 were probably more indicative of where I was to play international cricket then maybe than just on two performances at the start of the 96 seasons. But you're never going to turn down an opportunity to play for England. Um, I reckon I could have played in the previous two years as well. But uh, the opportunity came and it came, it came against India. That's just how it was. And how would you sum up, you know, that, you know, you made your uh, debut in, at Edgbaston. Mm. Not the best wicket, a bit of a green top, wasn't it? It was a green top. Um, but again, I, you know, I was young and things had moved really quickly and you haven't really... Uh, at that time, there wasn't spin coaches around per se. You, you got on with your game and um, you had guys I would talk to that you got to sort of know over the, over the time of playing against Middlesex with Eddie, uh, with uh, John Embury and Tuffers. Eddie Hemmings, you'd bump into from... So there wasn't so much spin coaching. You just talked spin with your spin colleagues around the circuit. Um, going into that series, I was pretty ill-equipped, really, um, to to deal with potentially bowling on a... The green one at Edgebaston, I didn't bowl much, so, it, it, you know, we beat them in just over three days. It was the, it was the, the second... Debut of, that was a debut as well of Saurav, yeah. Kanguli. Uh, that, I, think, no, I think Rahul made his debut there possibly, or in the second test, and Surav made his debut in the third test. Okay, so that was Trenbridge. the series when they yeah. all came to prominence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and we got to that, you know, that's, that game at Trent Bridge, which uh, was my second test match, and it was a flat, flat wicket. And I look back now and I go, probably what I didn't have then is an understanding of managing my game in that in situation. I don't think I'd have taken a lot of wickets. You look at it and go, 
Actually, Anil struggled in that test match. Kumble, yeah. Uh, Venkapathy Raju struggled in that test match. The spin, you know, both sides got 600. It, it was probably, if I'd looked like I knew how to manage my game better, maybe they'd have stuck with me for a bit longer. I don't know. Um, unfortunately, playing India early season, England wasn't probably the right formula for me, but it, it is what it was. Yeah, so you said that you played for that first, you played the first test match at Edgebaston, mm. didn't get picked for the second test at Lords, yeah. then the third test at Trent Bridge. At Trent Bridge. Yeah. You got the one wicket, um, Sanjay Mandreka. That's right, yeah. Um, but then England never came calling again after that. Well, funnily enough, um, not, not immediately, <laughs> nearly 10 years later, it was a very bizarre one actually, but. You know, we'll probably get onto that, but uh, I nearly, very nearly played in 2006 or close to going going to Pakistan when Ashley Giles broke down in Pakistan. Um, but um, I tore my ACL that winter, so I hadn't been selected for a winter program. Um, I went and did some ex like work experience stuff at my old school at Darfur Grammar. And I had my uh, studs caught in the mud on the rugby pitch and tore my ACL. So then it was um, suddenly having sort of flown through county cricket, England, a test cricket. I ended up finding myself in a very frustrating position of um, rehabbing back from my second ACL. So I'd done the first one in 93 and then when I did the other one just after the uh, So that the, summer. you had select, um, talks with the selectors? In in 2006? Uh, no, not... Uh, oh, in 2006? Just, yeah. Oh, in 2006. Uh, yeah, it was a very strange one, actually, looking back. It was um, Peter Moores, who was Academy Director then, had actually rang me out of the blue, said, had I been playing any cricket? It was, I can't remember what time of year. It was, might have been November, December. Asked me if I'd been playing any cricket. And I said, yeah, I'd just come back from a T20 competition in the Caribbean. And um, said, listen, Ashley looks like he... He's got an issue, hip issue, and myself and Gary Keady then went up to Loughborough. Both of us went to Loughborough, went through some testing and went through some bowling to the Lions who were up there at the time with a view that one of us might go out to replace um, replace Ashley. Um, England then took, the, Duncan Fletcher was the head coach, they then took the decision not to fly in a replacement. They actually stuck with Sean Udall to play as the lone spinner. And then um, post Christmas, was the tour too. So this was pre-Christmas to Pakistan, post-Christmas was India, and, and that would be now known as the debut series for Monty Panasar. So actually, so my opportunity there was potentially to get called out to Pakistan, play a couple of games and see how we went. But actually in hindsight of it, and you look at Monty and how his career progressed after that test series in India, and you think, you know, Monty was a, was a class left arm spinner. And then you touched on injuries there. Mm. Um, do you feel that just how do you sum up then you, the rest of your your career for Kent? It was, it, it was a little good. bit by yeah. injury. Yeah, well, no, as in when I was on the field, I was I was a pretty consistent performer. The things I needed to needed to have in my locker or in my kit bag for two, for ninety six against India, I probably had you know in the two thousands in terms of now game game management. And you got an eight for a ninety nine against against Lanks. Yeah, had a cut, yeah. performance. Yeah. yeah, so I, I I was a consistent wicket taker, I think. Um, and in between that, I never really had niggles. If I had an injury, I just went went the big way. You know, I had a prolapsed disc, two ACLs, a rotator cuff. Um, it wasn't just generally generally tight tight hamstrings and that kind of stuff. So the injuries were always of quite a savage nature, she kept you out for a while and ultimately career, my career ended on an injury that I tore the muscle um, off uh, in my left elbow when I was playing at Hoven in the last game of the season, in 2000, oh, the first game of the season 2009. So yeah, I had a consistent county career that could have been probably better had I not had four or five prolonged periods of surgery and rehab. And you know, you said you retired at the, in 2009. How does it make you feel having represented, you know, just one county? You're a Kent man through and through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, proud of the fact of being at one county. Not to say there wasn't times when I contemplated moving or whatever, but... Um, uh, Was that just for um, opportunity elsewhere in terms of playing? Or no, just... not really. Um, uh, more that you... I didn't potentially want to my my next few years to pan out as they look like they might at Kent and if things happen differently then you go 
actually, I'll stay at Kent, but if you have a 19 year career, you're not gonna have 19 brilliant years unless you're someone exceptional um, or in an exceptional environment. So there were periods through my 19 years where yeah, actually the future didn't look like I wanted it to look. So um, the closest I came was around 2004, five, I think. Um, um, and it was a time actually when Key, Rob Key became captain, actually um, Graham Ford came on as head coach and that, things changed. I thought, actually, you know what, I can, I, can, I can see out my career here in the next four or five years, however long it takes. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed my time there, but not to say it was always swimmingly beautiful and the future looked rosy. And Kent are celebrating their 150th year this year. Yeah. What makes the club so special? Um, if ever you get the chance to get round Canterbury and you look at the Cowdery stand, the Frank Woolley stand, the pictures of captains in the pavilion, um, the, history of, the history of the players who have played for Kent, especially through those, um, the iconic and halcyon 70s. But even in my time, I, I've been really, really fortunate to play alongside some of some county cricket in England's finest. Keezy probably didn't get the international recognition he deserved. Martin Saggers was a heck of a swing bowler for three or four years there. Mark Elam was just a top class all rounder. Dean Headley. So I played with a lot of very good England players, but I also was very, very fortunate to play with Carl Hooper, Andy Simons, Aravinda De Silva, Rahul Dravid, Steve Waugh. So, you know, in 150 years, when you think of the amount of quality cricketers that that have put on the Kent jersey, and I'm, I'm a small part of that, and that's something to be incredibly proud of, I think. And then um, from retirement, I know now you got appointed the second 11 coach in 2017, but mm. in between that period, um, were you just kind of honing your skills in terms of coaching, or what were you up to? No, for a couple of years, actually, coaching, I hadn't really thought of that. Um, I've always been very mathematical. I've loved gambling, so I had a couple of years where I played poker on the on um, um, on the European circuit and played a little bit on online. But uh, successful, I was actually. Um, but within the success, there's always periods where you where you lose, and that's just inevitably inevitable in a card situation. So, but I loved it. Uh, it was a great buzz, and it was completely different to cricket in a lot of ways. But it, it, the similarities were. Um, I, was, I became a real student of it. Um, you were travelling like you did in cricket with mates, you'd go, but this time rather than going to cr um, cr cricketing countries, I was going to Eastern Europe or Vegas or whatever, whatever. And I loved that for a couple of years, but um, not through design, but late in life, we had, uh, my, my wife and I had a daughter that we'd always wanted, and that completely changes the dynamics of what you want to do out of life. So that's when I started coaching, probably around about 2000. And, 11, um, 2010, 2011, and I started at grassroots. I started at doing holiday camps, doing freelance work here and there, uh, and that's when I started honing my So I had two years where I didn't do anything really coaching-wise, and then I started to get involved, and somewhere along the way, quite early 2012, 13, I think Kent asked me to do some work with James Treadwell, and, and that was a... a that was a route back into coaching at the professional end of the game, it's albeit very specialist and, and working um, specifically with one player, but um, what a privilege that was. And, you know, do you have any, did you always have ambitions to, to work in the professional game? How did that call actually come? Um, no, well, Jimmy Adams, uh, Simon Willis, who were part of the coaching setup at Kent at the time, approached me and said, um, um, you know, Treddy doesn't have any spin support. What do you think? So, absolutely fine, no problem. That was great. Um, got involved with that, uh, and then at another point in time, Richard Johnson, who I'd known through years, and we tr we'd been on the A tour together. Richard Johnson said, "Listen, we don't have a spin support in Middlesex, and we've got um, Tom Smith, Ravi Patel, and Ollie Rayner." So suddenly, the opportunity, opportunity to work comes, yeah. to work in the professional game. But at the same time, I was still, you know, running my own academy and doing some freelance stuff. I was working with Dutch cricket from time to time, go there three or four times a year. So I'd, I'd suddenly built up um, a sort of nice sort of um, portfolio of people that I was working with from a spin-specific capacity. Um, more and more time was being spent with Kent and 
ultimately Simon Willis left Kent to go and work as high performance manager in Sri Lanka and that's when Kent turned around and said actually would you like to take on the second team? And that has been successful because you won the second 11 trophy championship however it's... You're half right, yeah. you're half right. It sort of be, it's been successful but not because we won the second 11 trophy, it's been successful because um, the graduation. I, because I look at Zach Crawley with in in the Test side, I look at Ollie Robinson in the England Lions side, um, and those are your successes. Um, trying to get these guys when they come into your system in second team from academy, getting them to understand second team as quickly as we can and what it takes to succeed at the first team. It's not about getting them to live in the second team for five years. It's about using the second team as a stepping stone. And the guys generally they're all there because they have ability. It's the mental side of the game, it's the understanding of the game, it's game management stuff that I alluded to earlier, which I didn't have when I made my test debut. I'm trying to impart that into Zach, uh, Ollie Robinson, Imran Kayyum and these guys. And in, in those cases, they're the successes. Imran in terms of white ball cricket, but Imran Kayyum is a left arm spinner in, in, the, in my trade that I, put, I, I pervaded for 20 years, trying to get Imran to be as good in red ball as he is in white ball is a challenge. So. My successes aren't because we won the second eleven trophy. It's because the players that you want to get in and out of your system, in most cases, have done so in the last few years. And you also you do work very closely with the Kent Academy as well. That's my role now. So yeah. I, I am no longer second eleven coach. Yeah. I um, I'm head of talent pathway. So I will have. So I'll, in essence, I oversee the Kent program, which starts in the area program before ten years old all the way through the county age group program up to academy um, and then trying to cr provide the county link between sort of the acad ac ac academy side and into professional cricket. So um, the role's expanded, not just isolated in the second level. I'm now um, trying to head up the program to... This includes also girls cricket as well? Um, not specifically under my remit, but again, there's a lot of crossover and we have a lot of dialogue. So um, Helen Fagg, who run, who's basically running Kent Girls Cricket, will will have dialogue with me on a regular basis around programmes, around um, sharing coaching knowledge, around sharing best practice and that kind of stuff. So um, my role is really talent pathway boys, but it will include dialogue and conversations with the girls. And now let's get down to spin bowling. Yeah. What makes a good spinner? Um, how old is he? Whatever age, it, it's, you know, at 13, what makes you successful at 13 is not going to make you successful at 17 necessarily. And what makes you successful at 17 might not work at 21. Um, what really is important, I think, is the ability to have a stop ball at whatever age group. A 13 year old stop ball generally will go up into the clouds and come back down and no one will use their feet or they'll run past it. At 17, if it's still going in the clouds, someone's going to hit you out of the ground. So your stop ball has to adapt to the, the skill level and the environments you're playing in. And generally, the older you get and the higher the level of cricket you want to play, it's your ability to have control of your pace range, have really good cricket smarts because the better wickets as you get older and play better cricket don't spin as much unless you get a subcontinent and then it's game management you know so a, a, a 13 year old doesn't really have to understand his fields just has to be able to get it up and down there at 15 16 17 you're asking guys to start having a variation that they're working towards having the pace range that they understand do you know your fields when you're bowling over the wicket round the wicket in power play one day three of a championship game so the, the game learning, the knowledge that you need and your skill sets need to develop so pace becomes important, the pace range becomes important. Do you feel at the highest level, I'm talking about international mm. cricket, I know you had a stint mm. recently working at the Under-19 World Cup yeah. uh, for England. Um, having seen um, the talent around the world as well, does a spinner have to be able to bowl the one that goes the other way? No. Um, Absolutely not. Um, it helps. Don't get me wrong. If you bowl it and bowl it well, it, it's a massive asset. But is it a critical part of your armoury? No. Um, it certainly does help you if you're an off spinner, I think, because off spinners are generally bowling it, spinning it back into a batter's hit, right hander's hitting arc. Um, but um, Lewis Goldsworthy, he was a part time 
spinner at best when he came into a program at the start of the World Cup cycle. I think finished the World Cup as the most economical bowler in the competition. And all he did well was he was able to repeat his best ball over and over again, which was to bowl back of a length and attack the stumps. Um, in that, we developed a pace range with Lewis where he had sort of a 10 mile an hour range to play around with and he kept, kept batters honest with that range. So, um, no, uh, a, a douche, uh, stroke caramel, call it what you want to call it, but flipping useful if you've got one, but it, it's not critical. And is there talent around the world, you know, that we haven't seen? Yeah, um, I think there is, but the, I think one of the things we've got to look at in England is um, our batters, we need to demystify playing of it around the subcontinent. So you see unorthodox actions, you see lots of funkiness in, their, in, in how they deliver balls. Here we're a little bit more orthodox, and the reason we're orthodox is because most of the time our bowlers don't have that volume of bowling that a, a, a 17, 18 year old Sri Lankan or Indian has. So actually what you're trying to do is make them the most efficient they can be with the limited amount of bowling they get through. Um, but when you go and play these guys, and I know because I've listened to the under 19 lads who sit in a dressing room discussing whether this bloke's got, how do you pick his wrong? And you, you, you almost get to get these guys out there a bit more often demystifying those, those mystery spinners, if you like. And then do you think in this country, um, you know, with the championship, for example, being played in April um, on green tops, do you think enough has been uh, put in place for young spin bowlers to actually be successful? Um, ultimately, no, because the, the evidence will suggest that there's a decline in the amount of overs of spin that are being bowled. And actually, you can even go next level of depth analysis into that and go, actually, and most of those overs are being bowled at three or four counties now. Um, so bookending four-day stuff doesn't help. But what also doesn't help is that in Division 2, certainly where Kent have spent a lot of time in the last few years, is that a lot of those games don't even go to day four. Now that would be one critical element. So this, the quality of the wickets allowing championship cricket to go to day four, allow spinners to bowl more in that. So the highest volume of spins, obviously day four. And if games don't go to day four, logic will tell you that you're not gonna get a lot of spin bowled. So yes, seasonally, it doesn't help if you're playing a lot of the cricket bookending the white ball stuff. But even if you are, can you play those games and make sure the wickets are good enough that the games extend to where the spinners can get involved. And then to put you on the spot, who in your opinion is probably the best spin bowler in the country at the moment? Um, in the, well, at the moment, in your opinion. Uh, to be honest, for me, and he gets a lot of flat, but if I wanted to go and play a test cricket, a test match somewhere and he's saying to me who's going to potentially win your game on day four, I'd say Mo Ali. Moeen, I think, still is a higher class operator. Um, will he play test cricket for England again? I don't know. I hope he does. I think he can bowl. I think um, Bess and Leach, both very good spinners, but they play at Taunton, um, which I think is a massive asset, obviously. So it'd be good to see those guys. Can they deliver those skills on a consistent basis on flatter wickets? Um, but Mo has done it at test level consistently for a period of time. Um, yeah. If you'd asked me this question probably 15 years ago, you, you, you'd have a greater pull. Amir Verdi, obviously, at Surrey, so we've got to see him, I think, go through a process where he's having a consistent year. He's shown the ability to win games here and there, but can Amir be a consistent performer over a championship season? Um, but 15 years ago, you could ask that question, you could probably have a, a, pool, pool, of yeah. Yeah, a pool of, say, 10 names. And then probably in the world, as well, if I ask you the same question. Oh, Lion's exceptional. Lion for an orthodox I mean, Lion doesn't doesn't have caramels and douches, but he has an exceptional um, spin rate for a finger spinner. Gets the ball up and down, gets a lot, lovely drop on it. Um, a huge amount of energy in his action. Um, and, you know, he can very easily go and pick off Ashwin and Jadeja and these guys, but, you know, let's steer away from guys who get to ply their trade maybe 50% of the time on helpful services. Lion, Lion's, his, his test statistics are exceptional for a finger spinner in this, in this climate.
So, Min, I uh, appreciate your time today. Pleasure. Um, fantastic career. Kent represented your country. And um, all the best with the coaching this season. Thanks, Neil. Cheers. Thank you. Janil Kagra, Cricket Last Stories. Min Patel. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.